Our speaker today, Charles King, is chiefly known to the world as a former research scholar at Crease. Uh, this is a post he proudly held in spring 2004. I can't think of anything else to say about him. Um, well, I guess he does also teach a bit at Georgetown in Washington, where he is professor of international affairs and government, and he also was recently emancipated as the chair of the School of Foreign Service there. He was also elected by the students at Georgetown several times as professor of the year. He was educated at Arkansas and then Oxford, where he was a Marshall Scholar. He's written several beautiful books, known to many in the room, I'm sure, including The Moldovans, The Ghost of Freedom, A History of the Caucasus, The Black Sea. And in fact, we had him in mind for that last book when our sister center for European studies coordinated yet another theme semester now underway on the Mediterranean. From a crease perspective, the Black Sea seemed to be an important part of that story. But of course, now that he's here, it turns out he has yet another, even more beautifully written book in press about this same area of the world, which he'll be discussing today. That is called Odessa, Genius and Death in a City of Dreams, just published on Monday, right? Last Monday. This is fresh off the presses by Norton. We have a copy of it up on the table here. I don't want to steal any of his substantive thunder of this talk today. I don't usually, however, have the chance to let The Economist write any part of my introductions, but as those of you who subscribe saw in the most recent issue, or actually the 26th of February issue, one comes across this. Mysterious and melancholy with its exotic airs of the Black Sea suffusing its stones, Odessa defies categorization. It's Russian to the core, yet in many ways not Russian at all. Scouted by a Neapolitan mercenary, named by a Russian empress, governed by her one-eyed secret husband, built by two exiled French noblemen, modernized by a Cambridge-educated count, and celebrated by his wife's Russian lover, end quote. With this thumbnail historical sketch, Charles King, an American academic, opens his finely written and evocative portrait of the city, which is now a reluctant and semi-detached part of independent Ukraine. This is the kind of review that most authors dream about having their press place upon their book's appearance. It concludes that Odessa is distinguished by its detail, coupled with a fine feel for the sweep of history that make this book a worthy tribute to one of Europe's greatest and least known cities. He's here today to talk with us about this book and to present part of it that is singled out for particular praise and is particularly important by The Economist and by many others, The Devastating and Tragic End of Jewish Odessa. Professor Charles King. Uh, thanks very much, Doug, for that um, very kind introduction, and um, and also to the to the center for hosting me. I spent a spent a wonderful semester here, which we call in Washington the spring semester. I think you call it the winter semester, and I I, I uh, understand why uh, after having been here during that um, that period. But I'm delighted to be back again. Can everybody in the back hear me? Okay. Um, well. As was said in the introduction, this, this book uh, is just out, and it's called Odessa, Genius and Death uh, in a City of Dreams. It is uh, the story of how a great European cosmopolitan and Jewish city stopped being a great cosmopolitan and Jewish city. It, it ends up being a rather dark story. Um, Odessans, by and large, will probably not like it uh, because it, it, while at the same time mentions and gives some sense of the cosmopolitan origins of this city, the high point or the low point of the book comes with the end of that sense of cosmopolitanism. And in fact, uh, one of the great themes of the book running through it is the fragility of cosmopolitanism. And the, let me give you the, the sort of upshot of the, of, of the book at the beginning of the talk. The, the idea that being cosmopolitan, being multicultural is not actually a virtue, it's more like a project. And when you let that project slide uh, because of some kind of external shock, in this case, uh, military occupation, when you stop working at it, um, it disappears uh, relatively, relatively quickly. And so the book takes a rather dark turn right in the middle uh, in two chapters on the remaining occupation of the city from the fall of 1941 to the spring of 1944, which is what I'd, I'd like to concentrate on. Uh, today, but then it has a kind of elegiac and nostalgic end because the last chapter of the book is about Brighton Beach, um, a little Odessa in Brooklyn, um, and about the way in which nostalgia 
uh, for a lost period or a lost time gets, gets reproduced, and perhaps more broadly about how all great cities, in a way, find ways of reproducing themselves over time, maybe poetically in the hearts and minds of the people who used to, used to live there, but also physically by recreating themselves in new kinds of spaces through their, their diasporas. Um, the, the, the book itself, uh, although I didn't realize it when I, when I started, um, was actually inspired by, by a building. This is a building that's located at the corner of Zhukovsky Street and Pushkin Street um, in Odessa. And for those of you who have been to the city, you know that the, the old city center is an Enlightenment era vision of what a city should be, precisely because it was an I Enlightenment era project for what a city should be. It's a city that's younger than Washington, D.C. It's a city that, like Washington, has a city center uh, arrayed at sort of right angles, where streets meet at right angles, and unlike Washington, and helpfully for traffic in, in Odessa, you don't have avenues crisscrossing diagonally through that, uh, that beautiful grid. Um, implanted by Catherine the Great in 1794 on the advice of uh, a mercenary in her service, uh, a person by the name of José de Ribas. Uh, you may guess from his name that he wasn't Russian. Um, he was a Neapolitan, the product of a mixed French uh, and Irish marriage who, like lots of other soldiers of fortune at the end of the 18th century, decided to make his way east, join uh, Russia in its fight uh, against the Ottoman Empire. He ended up being the adjutant uh, to another famous soldier of fortune in Catherine's service, John Paul Jones. Um, more famous as the founder of the U.S. Navy. If you go not far from where I live to Annapolis, Maryland, you can see his Napoleon-style crypt uh, in the main chapel of the U.S. Naval Academy. Jones turned out to be not a terribly good captain in a regular Navy. He was a very good privateer, uh, but not very good at taking orders from the likes of, well, Grigory Potemkin and, and others. Um, and ended up, this is the story we don't tell in American history, leaving Russian service because of a sex scandal. Um, he was involved with a 13-year-old with a Russian girl, um, and uh, Jones's defense was, and you can read this in the, in the papers of the trial, in the John Paul Jones papers in the Library of Congress, his defense was, well, she had never complained before, uh, which was a shocking kind of, kind of defense. And he also says that, well, he had paid her uh, for services, so what's the, what's the big deal? Um, Potemkin and others made a great, uh, a great deal of this scandal. Jones left uh, Russian service. And ignominy ended up uh, penniless in Paris where he died, and it wasn't until much later when Theodore Roosevelt began to build the U.S. Navy uh, that uh, Jones became the founder uh, of, the, of the American naval forces. His adjutant, de Ribas, however, um, was actually much better in the Russian imperial service. He made his way all the way up to the rank of rear admiral, uh, finally dying at the very beginning of the 19th century, having convinced... Uh, Catherine and others around her that this site on a series of bluffs overlooking the Black Sea that for millennia had been overlooked by Greeks, by Romans and others would make uh, a perfect place for Catherine's southern St. Petersburg, that is her city built out of nothingness, implanted where nothing had been uh, before. She bought the idea, success, uh, successors as emperors uh, bought the idea and, and Odessa by the uh, the beginning of the 19th century uh, began to rise where nothing uh, nothing had uh, had previously existed save for a rather small uh, Tatar village. So when you go to the old city center, you see this sort of Enlightenment era legacy, and this is one of the buildings that's there, uh, dating from the middle of the of the 19th century. Um, you would be quite right to walk past it. It's uh, sort of a blue-gray building with a vaguely uh, gothic uh, design, neo-gothic design uh, to it. It has a gigantic crack that runs all the way from the foundation to the roof line and judging from the garden is in a, a very bad state of disrepair. Um, it is now the regional archive of the city of Odessa. So anyone who is interested in the Odessa region as a whole or the history of the city uh, has, to, has to spend time there. It also contains um, important documents from uh, not only Odessa's sort of official past but from civil society institutions, the history of banking and commerce in the city, marriage records from synagogues that might have existed in Odessa but, uh, but do no longer. All of that is contained in the, region, in, the, in the state archive of the Odessa region. Before it became the regional archive, 
Um, it was the Rosa Luxemburg Workers Club uh, during uh, the uh, first half of the Soviet period where you could do calisthenics in the main uh, hall and otherwise contribute to the, the, the development of new Soviet man and, and woman. Uh, before that, though, it was this. It was the, um, known as the Brody Synagogue or the Brodsky Synagogue. It was actually one of the two most important synagogues in the city uh, before uh, 1941, or one might also say before 1919, 1920, before it became the Rosa Luxemburg Workers uh, Club. Um, the Brody Synagogue was important because, it, as its name indicates, it was founded by Jews from the Galician city of Brody, who began to filter into Odessa in the 1820s, 1830s. Uh, founding what was uh, one of the most progressive, one of the most optimistic, um, one of the most cosmopolitan Jewish communities, I think, in the, in the Russian Empire, a place where uh, Jews uh, were optimistic about their future, optimistic about the idea of integrating with Russian society, uh, became one of the real centers of the Jewish Enlightenment, the Haskalah, um, and uh, became also one of the most important choral synagogues in this part, part of the, the empire. The great cantor Nisan Blumenthal uh, worked here. Um, his uh, successor, Pinchas Minkowski, um, some of the great sort of cantors in, in uh, uh, Jewish musical uh, tradition working out of and through uh, the, the, the Brody Synagogue. So it struck me as uh, a very moving and dark irony that if you want to know something about the history of the city, and if you want to know in particular about the destruction of the Jewish community in the city, the place you go is to synagogue uh, to find out about it. And I spent a couple of summers going through um, a series of files that, that has, has been have been in incredibly underutilized, both by historians and political scientists. And if there are any graduate students looking for a great new project, the history of Odessa during the Second World War, I would, I would encourage you to, to have a look at. Because when the Soviets came back through in the spring of 1944, retaking the city after it had been captured uh, by, the, uh, by the Romanians, they took somewhere around oh, un a little under 50,000 files from the Romanian occupation authorities, and all of those are available in the, in the Odessa archives. Some of those are available in microform format at the U.S. Holocaust uh, Museum in, in Washington. There are, it's tens and tens of thousands of documents that really no one has looked at, including, I think, some very important documents that I'll get to later on in the talk about the nature of life in the city during, during the occupation uh, period. So this, in, in some ways, ended up being sort of after the fact, the in inspiration uh, for, the, for the project. How is it that uh, if you want to know something about the the dark past of this city, particularly during the world war and the fragility of cosmopolitanism, the place you have to go is to the old, the old Brody Synagogue. If there are a couple of characters, though, when we think about sort of the modern image of Odessa as a place, uh, these two characters immediately, I think, come to mind, uh, shown here together working on their great unfinished film, Beijing Meadow. Um, on the left, uh, Isaac Bobble, uh, the very important native Odessa uh, short story uh, writer and quasi-journalist um, who immortalized one aspect of Odessa that I think became fused with the identity of the city as a whole. That is, the, the underworld of Odessa that is revealed so spectacularly in uh, the Odessa stories, the Odessa tales. Um, he was writing about not just his native city in those stories, but his native neighborhood the area just to the northwest of the city center, a very short walk from the Brody Synagogue called Moldavanka, uh, the neighborhood that was uh, in his day and in his imagination the place of Jewish gangsters and ne'er-do-wells of prostitutes and bent cops uh, that became in some ways symbolic of what this rowdy port city was uh, as, as a whole. And there is um, just a couple of years ago, a magnificent new translation of the entire um, extant works of Isaac Bobble by Peter Constantine that I would, um, that I would encourage you to look at if you, if you, um, if you haven't seen it. Um, but you know, the, the thing to remember about Bobble, I think, is that by the time he's writing, at the very beginning of the 20th century, uh, the Odessa, the, the Odessa, what will become the Odessa stories, 
um, this world is already passing. The world, he's already engaged in a kind of project of nostalgia about a world that was already disappearing, about a world that was becoming much less um, a, a place of good-natured gangsters and much more a place of, of incredible violence. The story I try to tell in the middle parts of the book is about how this freewheeling, cosmopolitan, optimistic, and outward-looking city also becomes, by the beginning of the 20th century, one of the most violent places um, in, the, in the empire, where, where the rate of suicides is higher than in Moscow and in St. Petersburg, in fact, higher than in virtually every other major city in the empire that experiences the largest and most significant pogrom, anti-Jewish pogrom to date, in, uh, in 1905, and then most spectacularly in uh, the period from 41 to 44, loses the entirety of its, of its Jewish population um, from, uh, again, from the fall of 41 to the sp spring of 44. Many of those, many, many Jews come back to the city, of course, after, um, after the war. But how does, this, how does that, this actually end up happening? The person who is also to, on the right, who is also responsible, I think, for our images of Odessa today, is, of course, Sergei Eisenstein. Um, the uh, great Soviet filmmaker, um, creator of probably the most important visual image of uh, the city that we, that we have, um, immortalizing the famous cascade of steps that go from the top of the bluff overlooking the Black Sea, the city center, down to uh, the port in his 1925 film, uh, Battleship Potemkin, Battleship Potemkin. Um, the scene that is probably now the most copied scene in film history, copied by everyone from Brian De Palma to Terry Gilliam um, to, to others, the scene of the baby carriage teetering at the top of the steps and then making its way um, all the way down to, all the, way down to the, the port. Um, Eisenstein was commissioned by the Central Committee of the Communist Party to create Battleship uh, Potemkin, I'm going to use the American translation, if, uh, the American pronunciation if you don't, if you don't mind. Battleship Potemkin, um, in 1925, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the 1905 um, revolution. And he could have chosen any subject, of course, to, to commemorate 1905, but he chooses um, the mutiny on board the, um, uh, the, 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 the Tsarist uh, ship, the Potemkin or Potemkin, which left Crimea, sailed to Odessa, fires briefly uh, on the city, and then in Eisenstein's imagination, um, creates a, an uprising or sparks an uprising of workers and peasants against the evil uh, Tsarist state that reaches its climax here on the Odessa steps with the famous massacre on the steps from the film, with that line of jackbooted. Um, Tsarist um, troops marching down the steps, firing uh, on the assembled uh, populace, and uh, and then of course you have that um, that that baby carriage toppling all the way down the steps, and we don't know what happened to the baby uh, in the film, but we assume it probably wasn't a very good end. Um, Eisenstein, of course, in this film, like Babel, in a way, in a in a slightly earlier period, is engaged in an act of nostalgia, um, an act of sort of purposeful misremembering. Um, because what Eisenstein is creating for the Bolshevik state is in some ways its own prehistory. He is creating a visual prehistory for the Bolshevik revolution, and that is the failed revolution uh, of 1905, the uprising of workers and peasants in, in Odessa. He also misses, of course, the, the central event that if you actually experienced 1905 in Odessa, the central event that I think people would have remembered and talked about, and that's of course the, the pogrom uh, that takes place throughout the late summer and fall of, of 1905. Um, the only moment in the film when the Jewish question is raised, you may recall, is when um, a bourgeois observer of what's happening as the mutinous battleship comes into the harbor, um, a, a group of bourgeois observers yell, Be Zhidov, um, as the uh, sort of signaling the toxin for uh, starting, starting a pogrom. And they're immediately jumped on by uh, the cosmopolitan workers and peasants, sort of saying, we will not be diverted uh, from the cause of revolution. Uh, by uh, by anti-Semitism, well, that's not, of course, true to how 1905 actually took took place in the city. It was immensely violent, um, and unlike in other instances, uh, the 1903 pogrom in Kishinev, for example, it was 
a time when, in a very organized and planned way, local Jews in the city fought back en masse, which is one of the, ex uh, the explanations for why 1905 ended up being much more violent than other uh, pogrom activities, I think, earlier, uh, because it really did amount to, for a few months in Odessa, what, amount, what, what, what could be described as a kind of mini uh, civil war. That, incidentally, is the event that also um, uh, sparks the life and career of another famous Odessan of the era who's, who's, who's featured in, in the book, uh, and that's Vladimir uh, Jabotinsky, the founder of revisionist Zionism, the person who unlike Chaim Weizmann and David Ben-Gurion, gives a sort of right-wing slant uh, to Zionism, always seen as being a bit of an outsider. Um, but he takes from that experience of nationalism and violence and Jewish self-defense in 1905 um, a, a particular vision for what Zionism should be. As, as I try to argue, Jabotinsky is a character who actually pedestrianizes Zionism, sees it as just another form of nationalism, and sees the contest between nationalisms as essentially being a survival of the fittest. There's there's nothing special about Zionism for Jabotinsky. Um, it's simply, one simply has to be armed and dangerous to make your version of nationalism win out uh, over, all, over all the others. Um, but that's, the, that, that's the, the sort of beginning of the 20th century in this, uh, in this city, a time when the cosmopolitanism that had made it um, uh, begins to, to shake, when the images that we now apply uh, to, to Odessa's past were, were being forged and, 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 in, and in which certain repertoires of, of violence that would define the later part of the century uh, come, come to the fore. I should also say that in the book, I try to, the book is really um, built around several characters. I've described a few of them, but uh, Pushkin makes some uh, guest appearance. Uh, Mikhail Varansov, the count who was uh, uh, the person who put the statue of, of Richelieu, a, a former um, administrator of the city, at the top of those steps. And his wife and Pushkin's lover, Lise Varansova, um, plenty of these other characters are wound throughout the, um, the, the book as well. Um, when, when Eisenstein, though, sits down after the Second World War to write his, his memoirs, which are incredibly frustrating to read because they're like a long, um, they're like a long disorganized poem. Um, you might say his films are kind of that way, uh, the way, too. But um, he, um, in 1946, he speculates on the fate of the baby in the carriage. Um, and, and Eisenstein has to be the only film director in history who really had no idea who one of his lead characters was because he says in his memoirs, um, I wonder what happened to that baby. Uh, was it a he or was it a she? Um, is that person lying in a mass grave somewhere, he says? Did the person fight uh, gallantly um, against the fascists? Uh, was the person exiled? And did that person live his or her life, the rest of his or her life in, in exile, speculating that, that that baby is probably now in his, his or her 20s, if he or she were still alive? Um, because uh, Eisenstein, you know, any of those fates for that kid, had the kid remained in Odessa, would, would have been possible. Because the city was just coming off a, the, a remarkable experience, which in both Soviet historiography and Romanian historiography has been largely, largely absent, I think. And that's, that's what I'd like to concentrate on for the, for the rest of the talk, the experience of the city during, during the, the Second World, World War. Um, this, Odessa was the only sizable Soviet city, the most important Soviet city that was under occupation during the war, but not under German occupation during the war, and therefore makes it, I think, a remarkable case study in how the experience of occupation played out um, in, in the, the Soviet Union during this period. Um, in October of 1941, the city came under control of uh, Romanian forces uh, who had joined the Germans in the advance to the east in, from June of 1941 uh, forward. Uh, the Romanians made it into the capital of a region that they called Transnistria, which was a, a buffer zone lying between lands that Romanians themselves had considered to be Romanian lands and had liberated from the Soviet Union, lands that a year earlier in the summer of 1940, Stalin had ripped away from the Romanian state. 
uh, Transnistria was a buffer zone between that territory and portions of Ukraine that would come under German control and eventually be formed in what the Germans called the Reichskommissariat. Uh, Ukraine. It was never very clear uh, in the Romanian mind, I think, at this stage, um, what Transnistria would be after the war, assuming a German and Axis uh, victory. Uh, at times, the Romanians seemed uh, to indicate that they would annex Transnistria and would just become a part of the post-war Romanian state. At other times, the idea was that it would be uh, simply an area that would, they, would, they would sort of extract labor from and extract natural resources from and in turn ship undesirable populations to, particularly Jews and Roma. Um, but it became throughout that, that 907 day period in which the, the Romanians occupied the city from the, the 16th of October of 41 to April 10th of uh, 44, it became the centerpiece of Romania's occupation effort in, in the Soviet Union. Um, it was, uh, this entire effort of course was overseen by the person you see on the, the wall here, um, Jan Antonescu, the fascist uh, and I have no problem using that, that word to describe him, dictator of Romania during the, during the war. Uh, this, incidentally, is a photograph taken from the, the governor's office of, of, uh, of, of Transnistria in Odessa. The building itself is the Vorontsov Palace. Um, the palace of Count Voronsov, which you can still sort of go to in Odessa, it was the, uh, 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 the palace of the local governor during the Tsarist period that the Romanians then uh, take over. It was a young pioneers hall just before this. Uh, the Romanians then take it over and, and transform it into the palace of the Romanian governor, replace a portrait of an avuncular Stalin with um, a portrait of a marshal, uh, Jan Antonescu. The person uh, standing just in front of the portrait, though, is uh, named Gheorghe Alexianu, just standing there at, the, there at the desk. Yes, he does have a little Hitler mustache. He wore it uh, throughout, the, throughout the war. Um, Alexianu was uh, governor of Transnistria during the war and therefore responsible for um, the changes, uh, demographic, political, and so on, that the that the, ex the city experienced uh, from 41 to, to 44. Uh, he was, here, here you see him again in the far, far right. Um, this is not, incidentally, the, uh, the, the sort of Hitler salute. It's the Romanian salute or the Roman salute, as, as they would, would have called it. Uh, it just sort of looks like the same one the Nazis were doing, but it was actually a different thing um, from the, uh, from the, in, in, in the Romanian experience. Um, Alexiano uh, was, in some ways, the ideal administrator uh, for a region that was meant to be a kind of dumping ground for Jews from occupied territories that Romania took control of, Roma and, and, and others. I say ideal administrator because he had, ex had experience doing virtually the same thing in the late 1930s. He was the uh, royal, ad uh, royal resident, as it was called, or the, king, the Romanian king's personal representative in Bukovina. Uh, in the northeast of Romania, a territory that had been taken by the Romanians uh, from the Austro-Hungarian Empire at the end of the First World War that had a very large Jewish population, particularly in its central capital city, Chernivtsi, as the Romanians call it, or Chernivtsi, uh, as the, uh, the uh, Ukrainians now call it. Um, he had banned the use of Yiddish in public. He, had, he was a, a dyed-in-the-wool anti-Semite, had went far beyond, even the late 1930s, the, um, the Romanian king's view of Jews and had, uh, had uh, in, in fact, created a whole series of laws uh, that made it very difficult to be Jewish in this great Jewish city. Uh, when he was moved to Odessa in 1941, he enacted the same kinds of policies uh, there. In particular, the creation of something that Odessa never in its history had, which is a Jewish ghetto. Um, it had, uh, from its foundation in 1794 all the way up to 1941, uh, there had never been a Jewish neighborhood as such. There was the area of Moldavanka that Babel wrote about, but that happened to be his neighborhood, not the Jewish neighborhood of Odessa. Jews lived wherever they could afford to live. Um, in the city. There was a Jewish street in the old, in the old uh, city center of Odessa, but it wasn't the place where Jews sort of, sort of lived. Um, from the fall of 1941, Alexianu uh, orders the creation of a Jewish uh, ghetto, and by January of 1942, the emptying of the, the Jewish uh, ghetto. That is, the creation of camps, 
other ghettos, deportation centers farther inland to which uh, Odessa's Jewish population is deported. In the fall of 1941, when the Romanians take over, the Jewish population in Odessa is around 200,000 people. It's a, a third of the total. When the Soviets come back in, in the spring of 1944, they do um, a quick census. In fact, the census doesn't take place for about three or four months later after the city has been, has been liberated, and they count 48 Jews still living there, um, 200,000 to 48. It's, it's a remarkable um, uh, change from, uh, I mean, to say the least, uh, to, to a, a population that had been core to this city's um, uh, commerce, identity, art scene, and, and so on. The good news is that um, the vast majority of those 200,000 probably got out of the city uh, before uh, the Romanians took, took control as part of the vast Soviet evacuation effort from June to through September of 1941, leaving in ships from the port of Odessa going to places like Novorossiysk and then often overland uh, to, to, Central, to Central Asia, to Tashkent and other places where they spent the duration. Uh, of the of the war. In fact, when I was giving a talk on this book at the Jewish Museum in New York last week, and a woman came up after the talk um, uh, and and said that she was on the last ship uh, out of Odessa in September of 1941, remembered going across the Black Sea, Novorossiysk, and so on. Really remarkable story. Um, but we know that there are about 70 or 80 thousand Jews left in the city. Uh, on the estimate of the mayor of o the Romanian mayor of Odessa, who is another character I'll get to in just a moment, 70 or 80,000 Jews in the city in October of 1941. So that number goes to 48 by not 40 again, not 48,000, 48 people um, by the spring of 44. And most of those 48 were probably not even from Odessa. They were people brought in from outside the city to work in uh, work as servants or in craft trades or or, or, or otherwise for the occupation authorities. The thing that becomes the spark for the elimination of this community, though, is not just the, the sort of native anti-Semitism of a person like Alexianu or the policies of the Romanian state. It's actually an event. On, on October 22nd, 1941, the old NKVD headquarters in uh, Odessa is bombed, uh, probably by... Uh, the NKVD itself, because those headquarters had been taken over as the military command headquarters of the Romanian occupation authorities, with a few German liaison officers who were who were there as well. Several dozen Romanian officers and administrators uh, are killed, and Antonescu at that point, once he learns of this, <coughs> sends a telegram to the military occupation authorities ordering the mass killing of, uh, of Jews and other, quote, communists in the city in October and November. If that story sounds familiar to you, you may be thinking of what had happened just a week earlier, which is uh, the bombing of the German military headquarters in Kiev, which is the thing that sparks the largest single massacre of the war at, at Baba Yar, where around 33,000 Jews over the course of a few days are killed by um, by German order police uh, and, and, uh, and others and, and dumped in a ravine in the center, center of Kiev. Odessa has its own version of this because what happens then throughout the fall is the mass, the mass hanging, um, uh, shooting, and immolation uh, of Jews at the hands of the, the Romanian authorities. Those who remain and are confined to the ghetto are then moved out of the city in January of, of 42, um, when, the, when the ghetto is, is emptied. And from that point forward, Jews who remain in the city are either in hiding or have managed to change their identity in some ways through changed identity papers. Um, one of, the, one of the, the, the more popular ways of doing this is to get someone to certify your identity as, as being a Karaite Jew or a, or a member of the Karaim uh, sect, that is uh, the group of pre-Talmudic Jews that, of which there was a sizable community in Odessa and Crimea and elsewhere um, around the northern coast uh, of the Black Sea, who were considered to be perhaps culturally Jewish, but not racially Jewish from, uh, from a German and Romanian point of view. Um, the other person who's, uh, another person whose story I, I try to tell in the book from this period is, uh, is the story of uh, this man. Uh, German Punta is his name. He was the mayor of Odessa throughout the war. Alexiano was the regional governor of Transnistria. Puntao was the, the, the actual governor of the, or the mayor of the city. He also was supremely well qualified for the job um, because he had been mayor of the uh, city of Kishinev in the 
uh, briefly independent Bessarabian uh, Republic. I thought I was done with Moldovan things and then I get, get pulled back in. Um, in 1917-1918. Uh, in in and so he knew something about administering a kind of borderland city. He was fluent in both Romanian and Russian, in fact, conducted the business of Odessa throughout the occupation period in Russian, uh, which made him very suspect in the eyes of Alexianu and, and others. Puntea uh, abhors the treatment of Jews in the city at the hands of Alexianu and the Romanian military authorities. He writes a pleading letter to Antonescu, the Romanian dictator in the fall of 41. He writes another pleading letter to his immediate superior, Alexianu, also in the fall of 41, spring of 42, um, decrying the emptying of the ghetto and the way in which Jews in the city are, are treated, especially this equation between Jewish and being Jewish and being communist, or being Jewish and being a terrorist in the, 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 the language of the of the time. He says this is absolute nonsense. The underground in Odessa was defeated almost as soon as Romanians take control of the city. There are no terrorists hiding out in the catacombs of this occupied um, city. At the same time, um, Punteo remains in his job. Um, he's, uh, he has an official seat on the committee uh, for um, uh, evacuation, as it's called, that is the removal of the Jews from the city. He's supposed to be overseeing it. He can't stomach going to these meetings himself, so he sends a deputy. Um, but he doesn't resign from his job. He remains in his post uh, until, uh, until the spring of 1944. After the war, uh, both Alexiano and Punta are, um, are prosecuted by the Romanian communist authorities. Alexiano is one of only four Romanians who are executed by the communist authorities for war crimes and crimes against humanity in the post-war trials. Antonescu is another one. There's another Antonescu not related to him who had been a uh, deputy prime minister. There's, a, there's an interior minister uh, who is, uh, who is uh, shot. And, and then Alexiano is the fourth. Punta is repeatedly prosecuted, repeatedly jailed, all the way until his death in 1968. He's sort of in jail, out of jail, in jail, out of jail. Um, the communists, though, by the 1950s, are much more interested in him, not, not interested in him really because of what he had done during the war, but because they suspect him of being a Moldovan nationalist. He had been mayor of Kishinev in this independent Bessarabian republic, and by the 50s and 60s, that becomes much more meaningful to them than, than, than anything else. Um, so in many ways, the story I try to tell is Punta as being the kind of representative Odessan in a way. No Odessan would at all claim him now. I mean, he's sort of written out of the city's history. He was part of the occupation authorities. But this ambiguous nature um, uh, during, during the war, um, standing by, continuing in his job while he knew what was going on, uh, he knew about the destruction of the Jewish community, um, and, and really doing the sort of minimum uh, to counter it, I think is much more emblematic of what the city was like during this, during this period. The thing that I came across that, that um, I think is maybe most revealing of this period in the Odessa archives are a whole series of files, 91 files, with hundreds of pages per file of denunciation letters that average Odessans sent in to the Romanian occupation authorities during the war. I came across these completely by, by accident. Um, but I think no, I really think no one has seen them since 1944. Uh, certainly if you look on the inside of the, uh, of the archival folders, no one has signed them out. And they're really quite incredible reading. And I have to, I have to say stomach churning reading in, in some ways. Um, because they're about uh, the way in which not this city was destroyed by an occupying power, but in which the city in some ways destroyed itself. Uh, they are <coughs> the, the records of paid secret agents writing in denunciations to the occupation authorities. They are also, however, the um, clearly voluntary denunciation letters that Odessans are sending in uh, to the Romanians. Uh, they are written on sort of onion skin writing paper. They're written on the backs of old posters. They're written, uh, some of them written on uh, large candy wrappers. I mean, virtually anything um, you can find. And I just wanted to, to, to read you a, a small selection of, of, of these just so you get some sense of, of, um, of what, we're, what, we're, what we're talking about. Um, let me just read you the text of one to give you the, the sense of this, and then, then a paragraph that sort of um, describes them in a, in, a, in a little more detail, if you, 
if you don't mind. So this is the text of, and it gives you a sense of what um, what it sound they sound like. Clayman and Zagalski. That's the title of the denunciation. Fifty eight Uspensky Street. Entry via the courtyard. Director of school number eight, Alexei Ivanish Zagalsky, is hiding the fact that his wife, Klavdi Isakovna Kleman, is a Jew, and that her son by her first husband by the name of Vadim Kleman, 18 years old, is also a Jew, and that Zagalsky stopped him and gave his, uh, adopted him and gave his surname and makes out that he is Ukrainian. Klavdi Isakovna Kleman, with the help of the Jewish-run Soviet militia, managed to get a passport in the surname of her husband Zagalsky, and in that passport she makes out that she is not a Jew but a Ukrainian. A teacher at school number 68, Adolf Pose, enabled all these machinations. This information is given by Stasienka, a teacher at school number 92. You have you know, for those of you who work on the Stalin period, these will be very reminiscent to you because often, um, very reminiscent of the Stalin period, because often the format of these is exactly the same as, uh, one, w as one finds the Stalinist denunciations with, with the names or, or the identities sometimes, um, sometimes changed. Let me read you one other paragraph that describes what these are like in more detail. Others denounced people who were not harboring Jews, but rather harboring their old clothes, safeguarding the personal effects of those who had been sent away. Still others reported that a neighbor had benefited unduly from items left behind when Jews were rounded up by the Romanians. That is, complaining that the person was not sharing the spoils with other residents in the apartment building. Amateur analysts gave their own interpretation of goings-on around them, working as informal detectives rather than as simple informants. The mysterious paper found in one apartment might be the residue of an underground printing press, surmised one local woman. The portraits of Hitler, Antonescu, and Romania's King Mihai that had begun to appear in local bazaars were very poorly done and needed to be policed, said another. One neighbor reported that an acquaintance was usually hanging out with bad elements and probably up to no good. Quote, at the same time, his apartment is the meeting place of hidden terrorist communists. And besides that, his wife is a Jew and is entirely surrounded by Jews. So there, there are literally hundreds and hundreds of these that you find, um, you find in the files, and I think um, reveal a kind of fragility to this, to this city uh, that both this sort of our own memory and, and the historiography and the nostalgia that we might have about the city um, uh, don't, 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 don't allow us. Um, so the, the upshot of the book, and as I mentioned, it's, it ends in Brighton Beach. Um, you know, Pushkin once said about Odessa that in Odessa you can smell Europe, but if you go to Brighton Beach, you can smell Odessa. Um, it's, it's that you know, combination of, of sour milk and old cooking oil and tobacco and perfume and dill and you know, you know axle grease, uh, you know the smell. Um, and what I, what I try to do toward the end is to think through what the fragility of cosmopolitanism um, ac ac actually means, and the ways in which, through the early Soviet period, through the period of the Romanian occupation, you have the very values that the city uh, claimed uh, for so long, and now that I think we, looking back on its, on its past, through art, through literature, through music, um, think of, when we think of, of Odessa, that these values, in fact, ended up being very sorely tested and ultimately um, abandoned um, in this remarkable 977 days of, um, of, of the Romanian occupation. I've talked for too long, so I'll stop there and maybe we can um, op open this up for questions and discussion. Thanks.